Chapter 3 is where we're going to be tonight, uh, also in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and then again in Mark chapter 12. So James chapter 3, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and Mark chapter 12, going to be referencing all these, weaving them together for your encouragement, for your strength. Nancy, oh Nancy. We're not going to see you again till November, Lord willing, and the crick don't rise. And we want to pray for you before we uh, head into our study. Because you know what? We're going to miss the heck out of you. You take a big part of our hearts with you. You really do. And life's not going to be the same. Not, it's just not. Not without you, dear. Yeah, see, the, the peanut gallery's piping in. And you are loved more than you'll ever know. I know God loves you. But you need to know that we love you. We love you like our own. Your family. You're precious to us. You're gifted. And you've been an instrument for healing. We appreciate you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless this, our Bible study tonight. God, that you'd open up our hearts and our minds to receive that which we need to receive from you. Even if, even if it doesn't feel right at first, God, would you give us the wherewithal by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit to, to really wrap our hearts and minds around what you're trying to press into our lives. And Lord, we ask that your blessing would be upon Nancy. Lord, for her and Mason as they travel, Lord, would you be with them? Would you surround them with your protection? And God, would you keep them? And in this new season in her life and in their lives, I pray it would be paved with love, with strength, and with power from heaven itself, Lord. Only you can do that, so that's why we ask it. And so, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, Lord. So cleanse this, your servant, Lord, and take charge right now. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 3, and I'm going to read. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Why? I'll tell you why. Because when you presume to teach, you assume you know. And that's a big deal because you're speaking truth. We're speaking truth to one another. Now, I want, I, I want to say this. We all carry a certain level of brokenness, all of us. There are some people, uh, and <laughs> all you have to do is look their way and you'll see. Wow, oh, they're... They're broken. I mean, it's obvious, okay? But then there are varying degrees of brokenness even in this room tonight. I mean, there are things that you can't see, things that are really hidden well. We like to try to cover our brokenness. I used to think of it this way. I, I spent most of my youth getting scarred up, and now I'm spending most of my older years trying to cover those scars as much as possible. See, it's like that, isn't it? I, I heard somebody once say that brokenness is a bit like underwear. Everybody wears it, but we don't want everybody to see us in it. It's the same way for, for you and for me. And the big question that you would have is I'm even talking, if you're going to ask a question, if you're critical, well, you would say, how do I not be broken? How can I not be broken? And I want you to understand this. That's the wrong question. The question should be, how can I be whole? That's where you want to press. That's where you want to throw your mind. And in that context, I want you to know just how important it is that you understand why he would open this way, talking about teachers and them being under a stricter judgment. And number two, this is why he says, and boy, doesn't this just back up what I've been sharing with you? 
<laughs> Look what it says. For we all stumble. Everybody say stumble. stumble. That means mess things up. That means wreck it. We all wreck it in so many ways. And look what it, how it puts it. We all stumble. Everybody say all. all. That means you. And get this. Before you put happy holy Howie on some pedestal, me too. We all mess things up. Just talk to Lucia after tonight's study for a little while. She'll clear up the confusion. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle his whole body. Wow. He's mature. He's whole. That perfect, it, it actually means whole. He's a whole man. He's a complete man. I need to keep going because we've got to cover some ground. Can I get an amen? Here we go. Verse 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great force how great a forest little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. That's pretty intense. He's saying because we're broken, we have the ability to really mess things up. If, any, if anybody can really connect what I just said, being broken can give us a tendency to say things that really mess us up. If anybody's with me on that, just say I. I. That means we're all agreed on that. We have a quorum, ladies and gentlemen. I think we could pass this bill with no problem. I'd say this is what we call just everybody coming to the table and admitting something. You know, the beauty of this is it's not the word hell like you would see it. Hell, the true word here is Gehenna. Now, Gehenna has an interesting history. Gehenna was the place where they began to participate in rituals that were hideous. Participate in rituals that now we could see on any dark website we'd like to. And then, of course, the byproduct of those rituals were children. And they had a way of disposing of these unwanted, you know, dependents. They would sacrifice them in Gehenna. And it was such a revolting, disgusting place, they never built in that valley ever again. I've been to the edge of the Valley of Gehenna. Today, Valley of Gehenna is a garbage dump. They've been burning garbage there for thousands of years. See, it became such a repulsive place that they just, rather than trying to do anything with it, they threw their trash in it and set it on fire. They would throw human bodies on there. It was kind of a general dispensary for somebody who was homeless or somebody who was unknown that they found. They would throw them in Gehenna. So it was always the place, the valley of the place, where the worst, the worst in us, the brokenness of us is on display, Gehenna. That's the place where it stinks. You couldn't, back in the day, you couldn't get within... You know, you didn't want to be downwind. It was bad. It was horrific. And it's so much a shameful thing for those people in that day. And they look back and they hear these words, set on fire by Gehenna. I mean, make no mistake. This is what we can produce when we're broken people speaking broken words. We're producing Gehenna in our relationships. We're producing Gehenna at work. We're so good at tearing things down and tearing them up and making a mess of things just by spilling stuff, brokenness out of our mouths. I think he, he says if a man is a perfect man, he He's able to bridle his old body, but now he's moving into the tongue and how powerful our words are. 
I think it's reflective of our brokenness. If you want to know if somebody's broken, sometimes you can't tell on the outside, but you need to take a little time with them. Are you with me? Man, I've, I've seen people that I thought were just absolutely glam, wonderful, successful, until we spent a little time with them and, and began to talk, and all of a sudden you walk away with a different, different, completely different point of view. This is why so many years in recovery and seeing people in recovery, uh, the people I thought would make it never made it, and the people I thought wouldn't make it would make it. Simply because what I'm looking at is the exteriors. I'm, I'm looking at the tells, the clues, the things that lead me to believe that, oh, this person's all in, you know? But I'll tell you what, there's, there's more to people than meets the eye. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah. I'll continue on. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the tongue. Tamed, that means broken. It has been tamed by mankind. I'm sorry, I said the tongue. So every, I'll read it again, just because I didn't get it right the first time. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. In other words, we've been able to train it. That's taming it. Taming it is training, breaking its spirit. Usually when they teach a horse how to serve mankind, they have to break him first. And they do that. And so we can break him. But you know, the, the one thing we can't do is change the beast. You know, you can tame a lion, but you can't change a lion. I'll never forget what Chris Rock said about, um, you remember Siegfried and Roy and how Roy Horn got attacked by his own tiger, one that he actually nursed in his own bed with a bottle, known since since he was just a little cub of a thing. I'll never forget what Chris Rock said. He said, that tiger went tiger on him, which is the truth. I mean, it came out, that was a beast, and it just went tiger on him. See, you can tame them, but you can't, you can't train them. Not like that. He says, but no man, look at that, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison, meaning it's lethal. No man can tame it. You can't tame it. You can't change it. I mean, when we're talking about throwing F-bombs in the middle of compound verbs, you know, long, long words, compound, multisyllabic words, fantastic. You can throw one in the middle of that. Or this is incredible. We got in, incredible. You know what I mean. We know how to dirty up just about anything. You with me? And so it's more than this I want you to see. See, no man can tame that. You can, you can try to train it. You can try to, you know, restrain it. But you, it'll come out. You ever notice that? How it comes out at the worst possible time? And, and this is, there's a beautiful side to this. Don't, don't let me rain on your parade here. There's a beautiful side. Look at verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. In other words, we're capable of beauty, incredible beauty, the kind of beauty that can only express glory to God, the kind of beauty that's able to love the unlovable, that's be able to be grateful and thankful for the unthankful. We're able to be gracious to the, to the stingy, and we're able to do things that are beyond even our ability to wrap our minds around. There is such beauty that we're capable of because we've been made in the similitude of God. It's exactly what he's saying. We've been made in the image and the likeness of him who created all things. Him who created all things. He says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. You and I, we're, we're ironies, aren't we? We're ironic, aren't we? In, in one breath, we're, you know, like this and filled with love and it's, it's time to love everyone. And we're, we're pumped up at our meeting with love and gratitude and we've got a gratitude attitude only to jump in the car and pull down here to the turnstile and have somebody rage out in front of you. 
and immediately pour forth some things that ought not be so. How, how is this even possible? I want to get into that tonight. That's what we're talking about. That was my intro. Okay, good night. It's over. No, I'm, I'm not going to. Here we go. He says, verse 11, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. See, the problem here is, the problem here is that it's the source. It's what's in here, that brokenness in us. We're capable of such beauty, but at the same time, we're, we're capable of, be, of being profoundly ugly, aren't we? I mean, in the age of the smartphone where people are taking pictures, there's a lot of people that curse that day and the guy that invented these things, you know? I'm just really grateful in one sense that they didn't have them back when I was really running amok. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Because I, I know there were seasons in my life where I had some Seriously viral moments. How about you? So it's the source. Seems to be the problem. We're, we're, we're capable through our mouths. I, I want you to get this. Birds, often they sing. We were listening to red-tailed hawks flying over our, our home this evening before we came. And, and they, they whistle. They make noises. And these noises are programmed in them to communicate with each other. But it's not articulate like you and like I. It's, it's more noises, and the noises actually mean something. That's why you'll notice that some birds have the same song on everything. Makes no difference. Ravens, crows, blackbirds, same, ah, you know, the same noise on everything. But you and I... We can communicate thought and emotion. You can communicate in a way that's harmonious, that's like appropriate for the moment. A couple of words and it just, it brings a, a, a calm to the environment. We have that ability to have such harmony, but at the same time, we have this capability of bringing such dissonance into the situation. Incredible dissonance. I'm, I'm a master at dissonance. I mean, I, I, I've been like a steamroller, you know, a steamroller, steamrolling through life. And in every room I would roll into, I would wonder where all the flat people came from. That's the art of dissonance. Completely unaware of the damage I'm causing, even while I'm so dissonant. And there's a reason for that. It has everything to do, and he penned it here. He says, it's the source. Salt can't come from a freshwater stream, and freshwater can't come from salt stream, and figs can't come from grapes and grapes figs. It just, it's a source issue, and that's where we begin. Go to Genesis chapter 1. We read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in other words, what we see here is a beginning with blackness, with absolute nothingness. There's nothing. There's just darkness. And we, we see waters, but we don't know if, if that's like real waters or what it meant. But it just means this, that it's turbulence, it's chaos, it's dark, it's nothing. And then we read these words in verse 3. Then God said in verse 6. Then God said in verse 9. Then God said in verse 11. Then God said in verse 14. Then God said in verse 20. Then God said in verse 24. Can you guess what I'm going to say? Then God said in verse 26. Then God said... 
Wow. And then verse 28. After he makes men, and he makes people, men and women, he blessed them. He gives them a command. He said to them in verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I mean, just think about that for a second. He's saying, here you are. You can have it all. I want you to just take care of it. And, and by the way, I, I, I want you to see this. This is a pretty profound truth. I mean, God blessed them and, and said, be fruitful. Boy, I don't need a manual for that. I mean, seriously, they're there. And they're in the garden. And then, verse 29, God said, I've given you every herb that yields seed, and so all the plants and all the bees. And God saw everything in verse 31, and he made and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning was the sixth day. So God blessed the seventh day, and he rests. And then there was no man to till the ground, but the mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And so he had trees and, and plants and animals. He had everything at his disposal. And he was naming them all. And, and he issues a command. And God said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It's an interesting translation of the set, sentence. And in Hebrew it goes, Basically, in the day that you eat of it, mut tamut, which means this in Hebrew, in dying, you shall surely die. In other words, the minute you go down that road, you're going to open a door that you're not going to be able to close. And you're going to see things that you can't unsee. And you're going to get involved in things that you can't undo. We all know about that, don't we, tonight? Don't we know about stuff that we've done that we can't undo? Scenes that we've seen and we can't unsee. It's exactly what he's presented to them. And he knows. And then in verse 18, he says, and it, it, it's not good that man should be alone. Do you see that God looked on Adam's loneliness? And he knew that this was missing. And so he brought through forth the woman. And the amazing truth here is this in verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Man, I thought about this. They were naked and they weren't ashamed. Which means more than just their language. They had a connection with the planet itself, with the creation itself. And they had a connection with each other. And that connection went beyond words. In other words, their thoughts were united, completely united. There was, there was nothing hidden from each other. They were so open. It wasn't the fact that they had incredible bodies and they were incredibly beautiful and they were really taken with each other. There was such a level of intimacy that there was nothing hidden from each other. And get this, and God himself. See, they had a connection with each other and God, or better yet, saying they had a connection with God that was an ongoing dialogue, and from that connection with God, they had each other. They had a connection with each other. Which leads me to this, and I heard this the other day in a movie. I ferreted it out, and it's from a French philosopher. See, for most people, their lives look like this. They're human beings trying to have a spiritual experience. But what we see here in verse 25 of chapter 2 is this. These are spiritual beings having a human experience. They've got it right side up now. See, this is how it was meant to be. We weren't meant to be human beings having, enjoying a spiritual experience. We were meant to be spiritual beings enjoying the human experience. But we're broken. 
Because if we're going to read on, we see more here. Here it is. <laughs> got to read this because it's just such a trip to me. In verse 3, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, this is a snake talking to a woman. Now, does anybody else feel a little bit creepy about that? Or is it just me? I mean, don't like warning bells go off in your head when a snake starts talking to you? Like, maybe this isn't going to be a healthy conversation. This is a, and I want you to see this, this is a different dialogue than the dialogue that they're used to getting with God. Oh, now we have another voice in here inspiring us in a different direction. Questioning the dialogue that we've been hearing from heaven. Kind of parting our own route, taking our own course. You know, you'll be like God. That was the big thing. You can go up a level. They were at the highest level any of us could have ever been, and they got deceived with the promise of being more than they were. And isn't that at the heart of your brokenness and mine? That's why it's like underwear. We all wear it. Nobody, you know, we don't want everybody to see us in it. We cover up that brokenness because it's our ruination. It's our pain. It's our, it's the kink in our armor. It's the flaw. Man, have you ever been a teenager with a gigantic zit? You know? Like, like one that could be a giant snow peak mountain cap. I've had them. And, you know, some of them, they get in there big and just huge on your face. And you know what you look for when you're a teenager headed to school? You look for mom's makeup kit because you're going to cover that sucker up because you've popped it now and you need to cover it up so all the girls won't see. Even boys will resort to makeup when it comes to covering up the flaws. And so do you and so do I, don't we? Come on. Can we be honest with each other? We're all broken. We're all broken in one way or another. Seriously. I mean, I'm looking at a ton of really incredibly gifted people, but at the same time, you're incredibly broken as well. And we forget that, don't we? But the result of it is this. They were at one point naked and unashamed, and now, look at verse 10 of chapter 3. God asks him, what are you doing here, basically? Why are you here? And his answer, Adam's answer, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And then God's first answer is this. Who told you were naked? I mean, I made you the way you are. Who told you? I love the fact that if you were to back up to verse 7, you'd see that once their eyes were opened, their intimacy was lost. Now they didn't know each other's thoughts. Now they couldn't really put words to what was really going on inside them. And from that point, they invited dissonance into this life. Dissonance. See, we ask ourselves, why are they so visceral on the left? Or why are they so angry on the right? Why is, when somebody disagrees, why is it now time for flamethrowers and belt-fed weapons? Why, why that? Why is everybody so angry? It's right here. It's the dissonance of humanity. It's absolute dissonance of humanity. That's why I think it's a folly for a believer to get caught up in the dissonance of the right. As much as it is folly for a believer to get caught up in the dissonance of the left. Because here's the beauty. Jesus went to that cross. 
and he died. He carried our sin and all of the things that you and I have spent a lifetime perfecting the art of covering. He, he died on that cross to take it all away from us so that we could have a smooth road and we could be openly broken. We could just be incredibly broken. But you know what? God takes us and he shows the world what he can do with something that's broken. See, it's not about what you can become, but it's about what God can become in you. It's what he can do in you. And when he does it, you can say, you're not going to believe this, but I'm broken. I'm broken. But you know, God's good. See, he righted all the wrong that we're reading here in the very beginning of time. From the very seeds of humanity. Now I want to take you one last place before we go to our groups. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Yeah, yeah. Mark chapter 12. So Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees, these teachers of the law. As I told you before, they memorized the first five books of the Bible. Can you imagine? Every line, every chapter, every verse, everything. They memorized it, committed it to memory. They could bring up a piece of it at any point. They could argue, dance on the head of a theological pin. They were brilliant minds. And this is what they asked Jesus. Check this out. Which is the first, this is verse, uh, verse 28. They asked him, then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? In other words, you're talking to God. I mean, I'm just setting up a hypothetical, okay? You're talking to God, and you ask him, what would you like, or what do you want? God, this is even better, what's the most important thing to you, okay? What's the most important thing to you, okay? This is what Jesus' response was. The first of all the commandments is to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, now just pause for a second there. That is what we call the Shema. Everybody say Shema. Shema. Yeah, that's the first thing the children of Israel recited when they're standing with the gates of Egypt behind them and they're ready to make their exodus. Yul Brenner has thrown his necklace down on the ground, stomped his foot, and said, then go and take all your spoils with you. Okay, thank you, Cecil B. DeMille. It worked out great for me. But that's what happened. There they were, and they began the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, I want you to see this. What they're saying, the, the word is chayn, chayn. And what it means is a compound unity. It means there are different facets, but one essence, okay? So, what he's saying is, God is whole. When you say God is whole, that means there's facets to the whole. There's parts of the whole kind of like an atom, a proton, a neutron, and a nucleus. And they're all spinning around. And how they hold together, subatomic glue, they call it, they've come up with all kinds of ideas, electromagnetic force, but it's an atom. So they're, they're saying, the Lord our God, he goes, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It means he's complete. 
He's not missing anything. He's got it all, okay? And then this is amazing because Jesus tacks it on to another one. He says, and, everybody say and. and. You shall love the Lord your God. You see, he's giving them, he's giving them it's bigger. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Everybody say heart. heart. That's your emotions. That's contingent on what you feel. So in other words, it's a kind of connection, a spiritual connection with God that determines how you feel. And it defies how the different dialogues that are coming into your head and mine are saying. Like I told the church on Sunday, the world is bent on you blowing it. Seriously. What is news other than just stories about all the people who are blowing it? That's what it is. So the world is bent on it. Everybody around you, if you work with a bunch of different people, if you've ever been involved with the seniority game or the performance game or the production game and how you end up at the top of the pile, you realize that everybody around you is working against you. As a matter of fact, I was talking to this gal who's, you know, big time in blackjack, you know, she was giving us a ride, and, and she's going on and on. She said, you know how I started to win at blackjack? I started to join up with everybody else against the dealer, and that's how you win. But that's how the world works. We all get together, and we force our collective wills on everybody else. That's how it works, Right? So he says, we're to love the Lord our God with all our cardia, with all our emotions, with our feelings. So we're planting our feelings firmly rooted, not in what's coming at us, the drama and the traffic that's constantly coming at us, constantly drawing us out, constantly drawing us toward ourselves. That's the way the world is. We, we implode in this world. We, we just absolutely go inward in this world. But when we're, hearts are rooted in God, we're reaching onward. We're, we're, we're believing his promises. We know that he's going to come through. We realize that all things work together for, for the good, for, for the called, you know? We know that God is going to work it out. We know that there's no mountain too high and no valley too low that he can't get to us. There's no pit too deep that he can't get to us and pull us up. And pull us out. We know that by faith. That's your feelings rooted. Then he says, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Now with your soul is that which you've planted yourself in. It's the essence of who you are. You know? And when I ask you, who are you? Some of you might say, well, my name's Barb and I'm a nurse. Or, you know, I'm Jeff, I'm a mechanic. Or I'm a tile guy. Or, you know, I'm a salesman. I'm this, I'm that. You know, we, we identify with what we do. But we never define who we are. And so what he sim- did you just hear what I said? We always connect with and identify with what we do, but we have a hard time expressing who we are. Are you with me? So when I'm firmly in my personality, what do you do? What do I do? I'll tell you what I do. I walk with God every day. That's what I do. I walk with God. So, but what do you do for a living? Well, you know, I'm a... I'm a janitor for Jesus. I'll never forget, I walked into a church one time years ago, and there, there, was a, there, was a, there was a pretty gal behind me. I was single at the time. Don't worry about it, Lucia. But she was behind me, and, uh, and they, it was one of those nights where they said, stand up and turn around and greet each other. So I was somehow divinely stationed right in front of her, and I spun around. Hi, my name's Howard, and her name was whatever. And, and she said, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a custodian over at the city hall. And she immediately turned around and went to somebody else. I was like, well, I certainly didn't impress her all that much. And, you know, as for some reason, Lucia saw something that she didn't. And, you know, here we are. But the truth of the matter is we're, we're so bent on what we do, not who we are. See, you were made in the similitude of God. 
You were made in the image of God. As a matter of fact, one Christian philosopher, Dr. Dallas Willard, said this. He said, we were created by a creator to be creative creators. We were created by a creator to be created, creative creators. We are created by a creator to be creative creators. He's made us. He's given us the beauty, the ability to bring such beauty into this world. Such beauty, such class, such glory, such finesse. You, you and I, we were created for that. We were actually created to be vessels of it, of glory and, and God's personality. So if I'm a janitor for Jesus, you know, I'm a painter for the pontiff. You know, my great high priest. I'm a salesman for the Savior. You know, I'm a nurse for the Nazarene. I mean, it goes on and on and on we can go. See, what we do is we devalue what we do by what we're doing with it, not by what God is doing with it. I don't want you to see what you do as what you do, but I want you to see what you do as an opportunity for God to do it through you. See, we think too small because we get caught up in the dialogue of this world and that brokenness, get this, that brokenness is somehow a disadvantage. Do you realize that our brokenness is God's advantage? Why do you think he tells us in 1 Corinthians that not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty, I mean, David was the wrong guy to be king. David was the wrong guy to be king. He had zero training. I mean, his dad was a peasant. I mean, what did he have? As a matter of fact, if you read it, he's the least of them all. What was that 1 Samuel 17? If you read it, he's the least. Jesse, even his own dad, goes, Really? Yeah, he's, you know, he's a couple of bricks shy of a load. I, I paraphrase, of course, but that's certainly where he was. He was out taking care of sheep. How's he going to administrate a nation? Really? How does that even work? I'll tell you how it works. It works because God found a man after his own heart. He, a man who loved him with his heart, with his soul. Check it out. Check it out. And with all your mind. In other words, his thinking. Every idle thought was thinking. Always considering the fact that, that God's with me. That I, I want to make sure that the dialogue is clear. My wife will not kiss me without some sort of personal connection. There has to be some sort of connection with us before we can go there. So you can understand, I've been making a study of connection, trying to bring about connection. And I mean, the beauty of this is the same is true with God. We have a connection with him. See, what, what has happened through, and I want you to see this. All this was, was a reflection of verse 29 in Mark chapter 12. Verse 30 is a reflection of 29. Verse 30 is an expression of who God is. Love the, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your... You are complete in him who's head of every principality and power. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can, God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. I need to know that even if my life feels like I'm walking on water, the Lord has prescribed this for me. And even in my brokenness, if all my brokenness just spills out for the world to see, then that will be a glorious day because that will be the day that God takes over ownership of me. And the biggest mistake you and I make is we don't tell on each other enough. And I'm not asking you to tell on me. I'm asking me to tell on me. 
And do you realize when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In James, later on in the book of James, he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it says, connect it. And the effectual and fervent prayer of the righteous man. The Greek word is dikaiosune, and it means this. The state of him or her as he or she ought to be. Whole. Complete. In him. Connected. Connected. In my heart. Not allowing any other affection to come in there and rob me of my connection. Affection will rob you from your connection. Not allowing that to happen. Number two, with all my soul, realizing it at my very essence, I am no more than a vessel for something great. And then, with all my mind, in my attitude, in my thinking, even in my stinking thinking, I'm allowing him by the presence and the power of his Holy Spirit to come in and challenge me and to redirect me as I'm in humility and submission to him. And then finally, with all my strength, all that means is with everything I have, I'm yours. As we surrender, he sits on the throne. So tonight, big question here. It's pretty simple. I know you're broken. I really do. But you need to say it to him. You need to confess it to him. Because he, he can't fix that which ain't broken. He can't fix it. If you won't, bring it to him. Let's pray. Father, tonight as we looked at what it means and how we can be whole, Lord, would you, as we seek you, would you once again, you know, forgive us for hiding so much Lord, I pray we'd be brave enough to be broken. That we might be open to your touch in our lives. Lord, take our damaged emotions. And Lord, our, our damaged feelings and our, our identity being found in so many other silly things of this world. And Lord, have your mind on every stinking, rotten thought that would flow in, and boy, do they flow in, Lord. And God, I pray that we would, with all our strength, be whole, just yielded to your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. We go to our groups.